Thank you, Minister. That concludes general questions. And we will now move on to the next item of business, which is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Deputy First Minister was interviewed last week about Michael Matheson's dishonesty. She was asked if SNP ministers always tell the truth. She was given multiple opportunities to answer with a simple yes, but she didn't. So let me give her another opportunity today. Do Scottish Government ministers always tell the truth? Deputy First Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, before I answer the member's question, can I begin by paying tribute to the late Lord James Douglas Hamilton? Lord James had a, a long and distinguished career as a public servant in three parliamentary chambers, including, of course, this one. Those of us who served alongside him here remember a kind, funny and warm gentleman who embodied the spirit of cross-party friendship and collaboration, which is part of the ethos of this parliament and has served as well on behalf of the Scottish Government, I offer my condolences to Lord James' family and to his friends. <laughs> In terms of uh, Douglas Ross's uh, question, of course, it's for Douglas Ross to decide on his questions, but it is very telling that for weeks now he's had nothing to say on the Tory autumn statement that has been devastating for Scotland's public services, nothing on the cost of living crisis, nothing to say on Grangemouth, nothing to say on the climate emergency as leaders gather to discuss the biggest challenge of our age. Of course, these are, are Tory uh, priorities. Um, but can I answer uh, about his question about what I said? Of course, uh, ministers should tell the truth. What I was referring to was the fact that sometimes people get things wrong. Sometimes people make mistakes, including, of course, Douglas Ross himself, who made a mistake worth around £28,000 when he was late uh, with his uh, outside earnings. Of course, ministers uh, should always tell the truth. Douglas Ross. Well, can I begin uh, on an area where we will agree? Lord James Douglas Hamilton was uh, a true gentleman uh, and a friend to everyone he worked with, not just in Holyrood and at Westminster as a minister, an MP uh, and a member of the House of Lords, but also uh, as a local councillor where he started uh, his career in public service. And I think the tributes we have seen across the political spectrum uh, have helped uh, his wife Susie and their children and the wider family uh, at this difficult time, and they are all in our thoughts uh, today. But that was quite a telling answer. First of all, the Deputy First Minister it was basically saying there are more important issues than a government minister claiming £11,000 of taxpayers' money and thinking he could get away with it. That's why this issue is important. And the simple question was, do Scottish government ministers always tell the truth? We still haven't had a yes or no answer. We've had a conditional answer that they would try to, but sometimes they make mistakes. But that is not what is at heart here. It's what Michael Matheson claimed for. It's about what he said, what he did, and then the cover-up. Because it's quite clear now that this SNP government defends dishonesty. Michael Matheson claimed taxpayers' money when he shouldn't have. He changed his story. He made up ludicrous excuses. So let me ask the Deputy First Minister this. Does she seriously believe that Michael Matheson has been 100 per cent honest throughout this scandal? Deputy First Minister. Well, Michael Matheson has, of course, reimbursed the Parliament in full for the costs incurred. And, of course, Michael Matheson also set out his position in his personal statement in detail. And, of course, he has also referred himself to the Scottish Parliament corporate body. Uh, he has also recognised, importantly, that he should have handled the situation better and he's accepted responsibility and he's rightly apologised uh, in full. The appropriate thing now, of course, is to allow the Scottish Parliament corporate body uh, to look into this matter, and I'm sure that is something they will do with a, a pace that is required. Dr Ross. Well, of course Michael Matheson could have handled the situation better. He could have told the truth. He could have been honest. And, and we can't park this issue to the Scottish Parliament investigation because they are looking at the claim made for taxpayers to pay £11,000 of a bill. They are not looking at the statements made which now seem to have been dishonest 
from Michael Matheson. Let's remember, he's the uh, MSP that once bragged about watching six football matches yeah. in a single weekend. But now he wants us to believe that when he was on holiday, he never watched the games, he never knew the football was on, and he never spoke to, it, uh, to anyone about it. And when a giant bill came in, he was completely clueless about it. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, does she seriously expect the public to believe a word of this story? Deputy First Minister. Well, as I've said, uh, Michael Matheson has set out the circumstances uh, and the way in which he handled it in the course of his personal statement. And as for the matters that the Scottish uh, Parliamentary Corporate Body will look into, uh, that is a matter for them. They obviously can refer the matter uh, elsewhere if they feel that would be the appropriate uh, thing to do. Uh, Michael Matheson has given a, a full account to this Parliament and he also opened himself up to questions uh, from members of this Parliament. As he has accepted he should have handled the situation better, he's accepted responsibility and he's rightly apologised uh, for that. And I think the appropriate thing now is to allow the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body uh, to look into this. The reason I said what I said at the beginning about Douglas Ross's priorities is that uh, Douglas Ross has had nothing to say about an autumn statement given by the Tory Chancellor that has given no money whatsoever for public services for this government, for this country, for our public services for next year. I actually think the public are pretty concerned about that because that will impact on every part of the public sector across Scotland. If the Tories don't care about that, the SNP certainly does Thank care you, about Deputy that. First Minister, Dr. Well, of of course, I, I have spoken about the autumn statement, the £545 million extra money coming to the Scottish <laughs> Government to spend on public services. But the public are also speaking about this, about how one of the most senior members of the SNP Government, one of the highest paid ministers in Scotland, tried to claim £11,000 11, of taxpayers' money for his iPad bill. But the problem for the SNP Government is the public don't believe Michael Matheson. A poll yesterday showed the vast majority of Scots believe he should stand down. And that included a majority of SNP mem uh, voters who believe Michael Matheson needs to go. Now, they can see he's not focused on the day job. In the middle of an NHS crisis, the public need to trust the Health Secretary. They don't. Nurses and doctors, when they meet him, need to know that he's honest. He's not. The Health Secretary has lost the confidence of the country and he needs to go for the good of our NHS. This week, the Deputy First Minister said the public sector workforce would need to shrink. Shouldn't that start with sacking Michael Matheson? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, what Douglas Ross didn't refer to in the poll was that 72% were dissatisfied with Rishi Sunak's performance as the Prime Minister, and of course, 54% of people support independence uh, for Scotland. In terms of in terms of Michael Matheson getting on with the job, Michael Matheson is getting on with the job of being Health Secretary, ahead of what, of course, is expected to be a challenging winter for the Health Service. If Douglas Ross cared anything about the NHS, he would be objecting to the fact that next year only £10.8 million has been given to the NHS from the UK Tory government. Less than £11 million. I think Members! I think actions speak louder than words. I don't think, I don't think Douglas Ross and the Tories care about the NHS if they're prepared to support the Tory government on that matter. In terms of what the Health Secretary has been doing this week, he has announced £42 million of funding for an extra 153 doctor training places next year, the largest annual expansion on record. And, of course, he met with the Royal College of Nursing to discuss our agenda for change and to hear about issues facing nurses. And on that point, of course, there's no money for agenda for change pay from this Tory government for next year, Th thank you. which is an absolute Th outrage. Thank you, Deputy Question number two, Anna Summer. Thank you, Deputy Prime Officer. Can I start by echoing the comments about Lord James Douglas Hamilton and his sad passing and saying condolences to his family? I never had the 
privilege of meeting him, but I think you can tell from all the comments from right across the political spectrum and how much high regard uh, he was held. Deputy Presiding Officer, for weeks now, the Health Secretary has been trying to save his job while the crisis in the NHS continues. And things are getting worse. In one week, over 1,000 patients waited over 12 hours to be seen at a &E. Tens of thousands are waiting for crucial diagnostic tests, including cancer. And waiting lists are now the longest they have ever been. 828,398 Scots are now on an NHS waiting list. And over 80,000 of them have been waiting for over a year. But tragically, for many, they will never receive treatment. So can the Deputy First Minister tell us how many people died last year while on an NHS waiting list? Deputy First Minister. Well, can I first of all say uh, the government and I take these matters very seriously. Indeed, these are challenging figures. And we know, of course, that behind the figures are people who are waiting too long for treatment. Long waits are regrettable. Um, we have seen a significant reduction in the longest waits since those targets were announced. And we've also seen some improvements in diagnostic waiting times. The latest figures also show that NHS activity has uh, increased in terms of the actions that we are taking. Uh, we are committed to uh, further reductions through our one billion investment in the NHS recovery plan to increase capacity to help the NHS recover from uh, COVID. And of course, in each of the next three years, we'll provide NHS boards with £100 million to help to reduce inpatient and day case waiting lists by an estimated 100,000 patients and del deliver year-on-year -year reductions. Of course, none of this is made easier by the complete lack of funding from the UK Tory government in next year's NHS requirements. Anna Sauer. Deputy President, Officer, I mean, the, the government's head is absolutely in the sand. 828,398 of our fellow Scots or on an NHS waiting list, and that's the pathetic answer we get from the government. Now our, freedom, now, our Freedom of Information request to Health Board showed that in the past year, 24,567 people died while on an NHS waiting list. 24,567. Many of these people waiting anxiously, often in pain, for potentially life-saving tests and operations. Two years ago, Hamza Yusuf launched an NHS recovery plan that has failed. Things have got worse, not better. But rather than having a government that is focusing on these problems, we have a First Minister and a Health Secretary going from crisis to crisis. When lives are being lost, surely we need a Health Secretary and a government focused on doing their jobs, not saving their jobs. Deputy First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary and indeed the entire government is focused on the NHS because these are serious statistics and they are, of course, as I said earlier, behind every statistic is a, a person and a family and I deeply regret anyone who, uh, the, the fact that anyone has lost their life while on an NHS uh, waiting list. But of course, uh, these issues and challenges are not unique Absolutely. to the Scottish Health ser Service. Every health system is under the same amount of challenge. Uh, the, NH, the Welsh Health Minister said just uh, a couple of weeks ago, the NHS in Wales, like other health care systems, is facing the most challenging financial pressure in recent history. This is due to the impact of continued increasing demand on services, persistently high inflation on costs, including energy, medicines and pay-related pressures, in addition to the impact of the pandemic and ongoing COVID-related costs. We are all facing these challenges. And of course, as I set out in my first answer, some of the actions that we are taking, the 1 billion NHS recovery plan, the 300 million investment over the next three years to bring down inpatient and day case waiting lists. I would have thought that was something Jackie Bailey would have welcomed rather than uh, talking from a sedentary position. But none of this is made easier by the £10.8 million pounds that we have received or will receive in consequentials for the NHS Thank you, Deputy next First year. Minister. But let me be clear. Anna Sarwar. We need to move to Anna Sarwar. We need Anna Sarwar. Please ask your next question. 
Deputy Presiding Officer, it's not working. People are dying and waiting lists are going up. Our NHS is in crisis. Patients are being failed and staff are burnt out. And we have a health secretary fighting to save his job. I would say to SNP backbenchers, this is your constituents on these NHS waiting lists. Perhaps show some care for them. And after 16 years of SNP government, it keeps getting worse, not better. Shona Robeson was the health secretary who promised to end delayed discharge, but numbers are still on the rise. Hamza Youssef was the health secretary who promised to bring down waiting lists, but in the two years since his failed recovery plan, they've gone up 28%. That's 182,000 more people on NHS waiting lists. And Michael Matheson was appointed to fix the mess but today we reveal that over 24,000 people have died on an NHS waiting list in the past year. Deputy First Minister, won't you accept that NHS patients and staff can't afford yet another winter with a failing SNP Health Secretary and a failing SNP Government? Deputy First Minister. Well, as I said earlier on, these challenges, and they are challenges, are affecting every healthcare system in these islands. There's nothing exceptional yeah. about the Scottish Health Service or the challenges facing it, yeah. even though Labour would try to make it so. And if you look at the comments I gave from the Labour Health Minister in Wales, they are facing exactly the same yeah. problems. There's nothing exceptional about the problems facing the NHS in Scotland. And the action that we are taking, I have set out in my answer previously. We are investing, we'll continue to invest, we'll continue to make sure that funding goes to the front line and not follow, follow Tory spending plans. What won't be helped, though, is, of course, the Labour shadow Health Secretary Wes Streeting's answer that seems to be to open the door for the private sector to come into the NHS. I don't think that's the answer for Scotland's health service going forward. This government will invest in a publicly funded, publicly Members. run uh, health service and we will not be privatising it. I call question number three, Claire Hockey. To ask the Deputy First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle any stigma associated with disclosing a diagnosis of HIV in light of World AIDS Day on the 1st of December. Deputy First Minister. Well, tackling stigma is a significant part of our work uh, towards HIV transmission elimination by 2030. And of course, it's good to see so many members across the Chamber wearing their uh, red ribbons uh, today. This commitment is clear within the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Action Plan published this week and the HIV Transmission Elimination Plan, which will follow shortly. We funded the excellent anti-stigma campaign developed by the Terence Higgins Trust, the UK's first television campaign on HIV AIDS in nearly four decades. Terence uh, Higgins Trust estimates it has already reached almost 10.5 million UK viewers and listeners throughout broadcast media and 43% of the adult population in the STV uh, region. Building on this, we'll continue to work with healthcare professionals and the public to raise awareness and to dispel myths around HIV so that people living with the virus can do so without fear of stigma and discrimination. Claire Hockey. I thank you, Deputy First Minister, for that answer. During the debate marking World AIDS Day this week, it was very welcome that members across this chamber were united in their will to end HIV transmission in Scotland by 2030. Can the Deputy First Minister say any more about the steps which the Scottish Government is taking to achieve this ambitious goal? Deputy First Minister. Well, a vast uh, amount of work is underway as part of the Sexual Health and uh, BBV Action Plan, which was published on Tuesday, and the HIV Delivery Plan, which will be published shortly. This includes working with three NHS boards to pilot HIV opt-out testing in a &E departments, following an uh, e-prep, uh, developing sorry, an e-prep uh, clinic, and supporting our third sector partners in continued community engagement, such as Fast Track Cities. And supplementary, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let us never forget that the H in HIV stands for human, and there really aren't enough minutes in the day to name even a handful of the people this world has lost to AIDS over the last 40 years. Uh, many suffered that illness in the face of prejudice, ignorance, and bigotry, I'm afraid to say. 
It's good to see that science has come on so well in the last 40 years, but there is still so much more to do. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister if she will ensure that the government in Scotland pulls out all stops to make sure that we end new transmissions of HIV by 2030, but in doing so, also pay tribute to the incredible organisations who work day in and day out to tackle that danger much greater than the virus itself, the danger of stigma. Deputy First Minister. Can I very much agree with uh, Jamie Green and I think that I would want to join with him very much in paying tribute to those organisations that have worked for, for many decades um, from really, really difficult times when stigma was commonplace in every walk of life to a position now that thankfully we have moved on uh, a lot from that stigma, although too many people still uh, suffer from it. And that's why this campaign is so important uh, to break down those barriers and of course stands very much in stark contrast from some of the media campaigns from those decades ago. So I would uh, want to join uh, with Jamie Green and others in pay playing our role as leaders uh, within uh, this uh, parliament and leaders uh, within Scotland uh, to make sure that we play our role in breaking down that stigma even further. Question number four, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister when the Scottish Government will publish the results of the A96 corridor review. Deputy First Minister. So the Government remains uh, committed to making improvements to the A96, including duelling Inverness to Nairn and the Nairn bypass, uh, despite the stark challenges we now face on our capital budget as a result of the UK Government's autumn statement which, taking into account inflation, is forecast to result in an almost 10 per cent real terms cut Members, we need to hear the Deputy First Minister. Funding. So, just in case you didn't hear that, nearly a 10 per cent real terms cut in our capital funding. I'm acutely aware of the importance of the route to those that live and work in the north and northeast of Scotland. The current plan is to fully dual the route, and as part of this process, we're undertaking the corridor review. The review's initial consultation generated 11,000 different options to improve the corridor, and it's only right that these are fully appraised. I'm expecting Transport Scotland's advice on the emerging outcomes before the end of the year. Following consideration by ministers, there will be a consultation on the outcomes and an update on timings uh, for this, which will be provided by the Cabinet Secretary in due course. Liam Kerr. This review, which was ordered simply to appease the Green Party, was supposed to be published over a year ago. And the fact is that in 2011, the SNP promised the people of the North East that the A96 would be duelled fully by 2030. And over a decade of prevarication, millions of taxpayer pounds, endless excuses later, nothing. Not even a mention of Aberdeen to Huntley in the programme for government. Deputy First Minister, the people of the North East want a straight answer. Will the SNP fulfil the promise to fully duel the A96 between Inverness and Aberdeen by 2030? Yes or no? Deputy First Minister. I think Liam Kerr's um, pretty insulting, actually, to those to that consultation that's generated 11,000 yeah. different options to improve the corridor. Uh, that's a bit insulting to all those who have taken the time to contribute to that uh, consultation. Given the level of interest, I would suggest that that was the right thing uh, to do. As I said in my initial answer, I'm expecting Transport Scotland's advice on the emerging outcomes before the end of the year. Following that, the Cabinet Secretary will provide a, an update in due course. I've said we remain committed to making the improvements to the A96, including duelling Inverness to Nairn and the Nairn Bypass. But if Liam Kerr is serious about the importance of infrastructure, why are they then supporting the Tory spending plans that cut capital by 10% over the next five years because it's capital that is required to build roads and other infrastructure projects? So the Tories are cutting the amount of money available to do these things and are making no objection, as I can see it, to their Tory government down south. I would call that hypocrisy, presiding yeah. officer. A supplementary, Fergus Ewing. Uh, presiding officer, 
May I ask the Deputy First Minister a simple question? By what year will the construction of the Nairn Bypass be completed? Deputy First Minister. So, first of all, um, as the First Minister confirmed to the member during our programme for government statement to Parliament on the 5th of September, uh, I want to reiterate that we are fully committed to making improvements to the A96, and that, of course, includes drilling the Inverness to Nairn section, including the Nairn bypass, which already has ministerial consent following a public local uh, inquiry. Just uh, also can advise that Transport Scotland continues to progress the significant work required to prepare for the publication of made orders, including the compulsory purchase order, with a view to completing the statutory process as soon as possible. In terms of our infrastructure investment plan, I have said that we will set out that plan alongside the budget in the light of the changes that will have to be made in the light of the cut to our capital budget of 10% over the next five years. But I can say to Fergus Ewing, the commitments that I've laid out in my answer are commitments that we will make. Question number five, Pam Duncan Clancy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that some young people are leaving school struggling to read. Deputy First Minister. So I think it's important to look at the facts, and the facts are that pass rates this year for English National 5, higher and advanced higher, are the same as or higher than pass rates that were pre-pandemic in 2019. The PISA 2018 reading results, which looks at the reading abilities of 15-year-olds, confirmed that Scotland was above the OECD average, and 82% of pupils who left school in 2021-22 had achieved the SQ, SCQF level 5 or above in literacy. And clearly, any young person leaving school struggling to read is unacceptable. But the evidence shows that our young people continue to achieve well in literacy and English, and their achievements should not be downplayed at all. We should be celebrating those achievements. Pam Duncan I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer, um, and, and I agree that reading and writing, of course, are fundamental to um, future and unlocking um, young, a young person's potential, but I'm really worried about the response because one in three children in Scotland are struggling to read. The EIS say that early, early years teachers are reporting an increase in the number of children presenting in primary one with delayed development and poorer minimal speech and language skills, and the national primary school literacy attainment gap has grown to the highest rate since 2018. And of course, the Deputy First Minister will be aware of reports over the weekend highlighting concerns from Scottish teachers that students are leaving secondary school functionally unable to read, a situation former teacher Annie Glennie describes as unforgivable. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, does she recognise that this is a growing problem and can she set out what the government intends to do about it? Deputy First Minister. Well, let, let me say, first of all, on a, on a point of agreement with Pam Duncan Glancy, there has obviously been a, a, an impact from the pandemic on the development of, of many uh, children's speech and language in particular. We understand that, which is why it is important uh, to make sure those supports are in place to help those young people to catch up on the developmental skills that they require. But in terms of the, the, the points of the results, uh, as I said in my answer, the, the, the rates, the pass rates this year for English National 5, higher and advanced higher, is, are the same as or higher than the pass rates pre-pandemic in 2019. So we're talking about slightly different things here. I'm not, I will acknowledge absolutely the point about developmental needs, including, importantly, speech and language uh, therapy. But let's not talk down the results of our young people, which are actually, in the circumstances, very good indeed and something that we should congratulate them on achieving. And supplementary, Ros McCall. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, it's very challenging to deliver good outcomes for children who leave secondary school struggling to read if we don't address literacy in early years and primary. Latest statistics show that one in five primary one pupils fail to achieve the expected level in reading, and I note the comments regarding COVID. But as it is the Deputy First Minister and the government's job to deal with the after effects of COVID, where is the appropriate investment in our schools to ensure that no child is left behind as per the Scottish Government's promise? Deputy First Minister. Well, 
not a penny of investment for schools was given yeah. in the autumn statement. Yeah. Not a penny. Not one penny. And the Tory benches have almost to a person... Have uh, almost to a person Deputy First Minister, please resume your seat for a second. I, I, we need to hear the Deputy First Minister's response. Thank you. Deputy First Minister. The Tory benches, presiding officer, almost to a person, have advised and demanded, actually, that I follow Tory spending plans as set out in the autumn statement. If I did that, what that is going to mean is not a penny of extra investment in our schools or public services, apart from the £10.8 million for the health service, which is a drop in the ocean. So this government will not follow Tory spending plans because we recognise the need to invest in our schools, in our hospitals, in our police service. So we will set out our budget plans on the 19th of December, but they certainly won't replicate the reckless disinvestment of public services that we see from this Tory government, supported by those benches over there. Question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Deputy First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to mark the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Deputy First Minister. Well, I think we should all be shocked that in the 21st century, violence, abuse and harassment remain a, an everyday occurrence for women and girls. And we continue to have to take action to prevent and tackle it domestically and globally as a government, a society and as individuals. In addition to the informed debate yesterday, which I heard and I thought was, was very good, uh, next week alongside COSLA, we will publish a, a refresh of our Equally Safe strategy, which is aimed at preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls and fo focusing on early intervention, prevention and support services. Our £19 million of annual funding from our Delivering Equally Safe Fund supports 121 projects from uh, 112 organisations and almost 32,000 people benefited from those support services last year. Um, we, sorry, Rona Mackay. <laughs> Thank the Deputy First Minister for the answer. During the 16 days debate yesterday, we heard about the need for the perpetrators of abuse and violence to change their behaviour, but we know that it continues. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me it's therefore vital that we change our justice system um, including establishing a sexual offences court so that victims of sexual abuse no longer feel, as they have told the Justice Committee, that they are re-traumatised by the court process. Deputy First Minister. Well, I think uh, Rona Mackay makes a very important point. There is absolutely a need for reform, and I want to recognise the bravery of survivors of sexual violence who have spoken out to call for change. They have been clear that the personal cost of pursuing justice is too high and it's left uh, many re-traumatised. And that's why the proposals contained in the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill, like establishing a sexual offences court, are so important. And collectively, these reforms put victims at the heart of our criminal justice system and create a system that recognises and responds to the trauma experienced by victims and survivors to ensure that victims maintain confidence in our justice system. Thank you. We will now move on to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Kokab Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday marked 10 years since a police helicopter crashed into the Clutha Bar in the city centre of my constituency of Glasgow Kelvin, tragically killing 10 people and injuring 31. The Clutha Bar was rebuilt and opened again in 2015. A subsequent air accident investigation informed improvements to aircraft safety regulations, but the painful memory of that disaster still runs deep amongst my local communities. Will the Deputy First Minister join me in paying tribute to the emergency services, the families and the wider Glasgow community who pulled together in the face of such a tragedy as we remember all those affected? Deputy First Minister. Yes, I absolutely will. And I thank uh, Cocab Stewart for, for the question. Uh, the events of 10 years ago are still fresh in my mind. I remember it really well. And I'm sure they are of, of all those in the chamber. Uh, my thoughts continue to go out to all those impacted by what happened that night, to those who were injured, those who tragically lost loved ones, and also to the emergency services who showed such bravery uh, trying to save lives. I also remember the way that the community came together to show solidarity with all those affected by the disaster. In the hardest of times, the people of Glasgow showed a strength and compassion 
that we'll never forget. And it's right that 10 years on, we remember those who are affected by the loss of life, but also the communities that are impacted to this day. I call Sue Webber. Uh, Deputy First Minister, the use of mobile phones has been highlighted as one of the most frequent and disruptive behaviours in schools. Lisa Kerr, head teacher of Gordonston, has stated, teenagers rarely thank adults for placing boundaries, but we will never forgive ourselves if we don't act now. The evidence is there. For the sake of our children's futures and our teachers' well-being, will the Deputy First Minister commit to take immediate steps to ban and restrict mobile phone use in our schools as soon as possible? Deputy First Minister. So, as I understand, councils would uh, already be able to do that, but we'll make sure that Sue Webber gets a full uh, response uh, to her question. Um, and she raises a, a reasonable point, I think, that mobile phones uh, can uh, be disruptive. And, of course, the Education Secretary set out in her statement yesterday many of the issues regarding behaviour uh, in our schools. So we'll make sure that the Education Secretary writes to Sue Webber uh, with further details on that. I call Alec Riley. Presiding officer, anyone who walked from the bus or train station this morning will have walked past homeless people sleeping in the street. We now know that last year 244 of our fellow citizens in Scotland died while homeless. With 15,000 Scots currently homeless, can I ask the Deputy First Minister what steps are the Scottish Government taking to support people who will be rough sleeping over the coming festive period. Deputy First Minister. Oh, uh, Alex Rowley raises a really important point, and of course it is very much our ambition to uh, eradicate rough sleeping from our streets, and we're taking a number of actions uh, to, uh, to do so. Um, in terms of the the issues of the homelessness more broadly. Scotland, of course, has the strongest rights in the UK for people experiencing homelessness. And we have taken action on local connection, on extending unsuitable accommodation orders. And in terms of the funding, in addition to the funding that goes through local government, we're giving councils 30.5 million each year to help prevent homelessness. And we're providing 100 million pounds from our multi-year uh, Ending Homelessness Together fund. And, of course, we have also uh, uh, given monies to try to reduce the use of temporary accommodation. Housing First is also um, being funded in order to help people with complex needs, which we know is the case for many. And I can I just say in terms of the, the, the deaths, the estimated 244 uh, deaths. Um, I regret every one of those deaths. It is a tragedy, and every behind all those figures uh, is a person and a family, and we should remember that. I call Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Earlier this week, NHS Orkney was moved to the first stage of formal escalation by the Scottish Government. NHS Orkney is far from the only health board in Scotland whose financial position is precarious, with debt levels rising. But there are particular challenges faced by a small island health board. So can the Deputy First Minister confirm that the government will respond positively to any request for assistance from NHS Orkney? And will every effort be made to help NHS Orkney achieve financial st stability as soon as possible, while at the same time ensuring patient needs and staff well-being are safeguarded? Deputy First Minister. Uh, well, can I say to Lee MacArthur, the, these are important matters, and I can say to him that the uh, Scottish Government is directly engaging with NHS Orkney and will be looking to provide tailored support uh, to support the board uh, going forward, because it is important as we enter winter that NHS Orkney, alongside other boards, uh, are well prepared to meet the challenges that winter will bring. And I'm sure the Health Secretary will be uh, happy to update Lee MacArthur on some further details about the support that will be provided. I call Bob Doris. President officer, after First Minister's questions, I am meeting with campaigners who have been fighting to get a fair deal for clients in the Clear Solicitors following the firm going burst in 2021. It is estimated there could be as much as 100,000 people impacted UK-wide, and complaints I have received include what they consider exorbitant fees charged by solicitors to remedy errors or to make changes to trusts, as well as families discovering trusts were never set up by McClure's despite fees having been paid. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister how the Scottish Government can seek to support impacted families, as well as what reforms could be considered to prevent such failings happening in the future? Deputy First Minister. 
Um, well, I am aware of the issues that Bob Doris uh, raises and the number of families that are um, facing uh, dif difficulties as a result of McClure's going into administration. And whilst I can't comment on individual cases, the Scottish Government has taken proactive steps to help mitigate against such a situation. Such cases show the need for legal regulation that centres on the public interest and protection of the consumer. The Regulation of Legal Services Scotland Bill, currently going through Parliament, will introduce the authorisation of legal businesses. And this will bring benefits such as consistency in how legal firms are regulated with all entities having to meet the same high standards and a greater collation of data which would enable the regulator and the legal pr profession to identify and address deficiencies early, taking the necessary preventative action. I call Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the UK Government is banning XL bully dogs after a spate of horrific attacks, some fatal. But the SNP has refused to sign up to this plan. It looks like they are willing to risk public safety just to diverge from the rest of the UK. So will the Deputy First Minister U-turn and ban XL bullies before more people get hurt? Deputy First Minister. Well, that um, is a complete misrepresentation of the yeah. facts by Russell Finlay. So let, let, me, let, let me say what is actually happening. We are carefully considering the evidence on the XL bully dogs and whether similar changes to ban this breed should be applied in Scotland. Public safety is paramount in our deliberations. Scotland already has a dog control notice regime that is unique in the UK and focused on preventing dog attacks from happening in the first place. Uh, but we remain concerned about the reported attacks and deaths due to suspected XL bully dogs. And, of course, the UK Government um, announced uh, the proposal to, to ban uh, XL bullies without any notice to the Scottish Government and no consultation, which was perhaps not the most helpful way uh, to proceed. So we are carefully considering the evidence and we're meeting with a range of stakeholders and animal welfare organisations and we will uh, take forward uh, those uh, considerations uh, as swiftly as we can and we, I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary will update Parliament in due course. I call Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Eight years ago, the construction began of hundreds of houses in the Western Gateway area of Dundee. Those buying homes were promised a school and paid an additional £5,000 on a roof tax to help pay for it. After the failure of SNP councillors to secure funding, there appears now to be no plan on how to get that school built. This week, I received a letter from the Education Secretary reassuring me that the Scottish Government remains committed to working with the Council, but without a funding commitment, it's just empty words. So if the SNP in Dundee have failed to deliver this school, they have failed the community. Will the Deputy First Minister commit today that the Government will find a way forward to getting this school Built. Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, the Education Secretary, when she set out the latest round of LEAP funding, had looked at uh, those schools that uh, were in the bottom categories of requiring to be refurbished. She also took into account some of the issues of RAC that have been raised uh, in this chamber to come to the conclusions of the priorities that should be given to the latest round uh, of LEAP funding. What she also set out, though, was that there will be further discussions with COSLA uh, in order to set out what comes next in terms of the funding of the school estate going forward. But this government has invested uh, hugely in the school estate over the last few years to bring uh, up to scratch uh, schools across the country and those schools now remaining uh, in the, the poorest category is much smaller than when this government came to power. And I call Mark Ruskell. Today world leaders are gathering for COP28 and the stakes couldn't be higher. The UN has warned that current climate pledges are falling short of the action that we need and that we're on course for a brutal three degrees of global heating this century. So it is deeply concerning to hear reports that the UAE is attempting to strike fossil fuel deals at COP, worsening climate injustice for people already living on the brink of disaster. Does the Deputy First Minister then agree with me that at COP28 we need to see a just and credible plan for the end of fossil fuels, not secretive backroom deals? Deputy First Minister. Well, at, at COP26, we were the first uh, Global no North government to commit funding to address loss and damage. A year ago, at COP27 saw uh, uh, both a breakthrough agreement on a loss and damage fund and a disappointing lack of progress on reducing emissions and keeping 1.5 alive. 
No nation has all the answers or the means to respond to the scale of the problem of climate change alone, which is why the bringing together of the global community at COP28 is so important. And Scotland has much to offer at COP28. The First Minister is participating in this year's summit to demonstrate once again our commitment to tackling the twin crises of climate change and nature loss in tandem and in a way, in a way that is just and fair uh, for all. He will also ensure that Scotland continues to play a bridging role, ensuring the voice of women, young people and the Global South influence debate and influence action. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Mark Ruskell. And there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and in the public gallery to do so before the debate starts. Thank you.